Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic, joined by my co-host, Dr. Matthew Barton. Mike, how are you? Good, mate. How are you? Well, well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Oh, well, at least one of us is. <laughs> Today we're going through a really uh, extensive, uh, complex... Uh, is it extensive? Yeah, I think yeah. it is. I put up on Twitter a post of the photograph of the, uh, well, what we're talking about today sitting in front of me of my page. And I said, uh, everybody looking forward to this? And I would have had maybe 50 replies of no, current medicals going, oh, I've intentionally forgotten this. this Worst is topic ever. hate this. Uh, what Hashtag is it, Hashtag rubbish. <laughs> that was just about me. <laughs> uh, it's the... It's glycolysis. Krebs. Well, no, it's glycolysis, Krebs, and the electron transport chain, cumulatively known as cellular respiration. Okay. So it's a big topic. So this is how uh, cells breathe. It is how cells breathe. It's how we create energy. And you and I had a chat about how should we do this? Should we do this as a glycolysis episode and then a Krebs episode and then an electron transport chain episode? And we thought, well, I think what's lost when you do that is the big picture. The whole purpose of these systems, they all work together. And I think talking about cellular respiration in the context of utilising glucose as the primary fuel source for energy in this episode, and then in a future episode, we can talk about utilising non-glucose-based fuel sources for energy. So talking about fatty acids, talking about amino acids, talking about lactate, talking about ketones. We can do a whole episode following those pathways. But this one is fo following the glucose-based pathway. Okay. Uh, so beginning with glucose, what is glucose? Glucose is a monosaccharide. Right. Okay. So would you say it's the most abundant one? I don't know about the most abundant one, but it's the most utilized one. In the body? Yeah. Okay. So this is a carbohydrate? Yeah. In its simplest form, right? Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah. Carbohydrates are complex polymers of sugars and the simplest sugar, meaning you can't break it down any further, okay. uh, is going to be that of glucose. But there's two main other monosaccharides like glucose, right? Yeah. So fructose and galactose. Yeah. And because they're on their own, they have been uh, separated from other forms of more complex carbohydrate so sometimes they can be as a disaccharide which would be a fairly common way that we would ingest sugars right yeah so if you were to put sugar into your coffee or tea that would be in the form of sucrose and that would be just two glucose together right no yeah. no wait a glucose and a fructose together glucose fructose yeah yep. and if you were to have add milk to it mm. that would be another sugar that would be lactose which would be glucose galactose yep and then the last one, maltose. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, maltose. So maltose is glucose, glucose, which um, I don't know. What's malt? Uh, I don't know. Like, yeah. it's like a, I don't know how you'd describe malt. Okay. Milo? Is that malt? I was thinking Milo. Maybe. Anyway. So that's. Do people that, have Milo outside of Australia? Yeah, I think it's big in the UK. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway. Um, that so that's the disaccharides. And you obviously need enzymes in your digest digestive tract to break those into the simple ones, which again, we'll just say as glucose, fructose, galactose. Yeah. And the one that, you know, is, is commonly uh, problematic is lactase to break down lactose. And then as a result, people get lactose intolerant syndrome, uh, syndrome uh, symptoms, which would be bloating and diarrhea and stuff like that. Yeah. When you look at a more complex carbohydrate, let's just say like, wheat or rice or something that's probably just glucose in long chains right mm. and you just have to chop them into the individual either disaccharide or monosaccharides but event but essentially what ha needs to happen is you need to absorb these monosaccharides across your intestinal wall into your blood yeah so regardless of how you're ingesting your carbohydrates uh ultimately you're going to break them down into those monomers of sugar, yep. which will be glucose, fructose, galactose. And they get absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. And as we know, whatever gets absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream will go to the liver first. So the first, the beginning of this conversation uh, of cellular respiration, I think begins with these monomers of sugar entering our liver cells. And generally speaking, there are transporters of sugars called gluts. 
or glucose transporters. You call them glutes, yeah. which makes sense because it's glucose transporter. But I like it's glut. It's not how it's pronounced. No, they're glut. And I like glut because it sounds like gluttony, which sort of makes sense because you're talking about ingestion of, yeah, ingestion of food and sugars and things like that. So you've got various gluts, so glucose transporters. They're basically just channels on the... S- in cells that um, when glucose is abundant, they pop to the surface and they allow for glucose to diffuse into the cell. So the point here is glucose can't get across the cell membrane without these transporters? Yeah, glucose is a polar molecule. So if you look at glucose and write it down chemically, it's C6H12O6. Six six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. And because of those oxygens and the way it's configured, it is charged. So that's what we call a polar molecule. And we know that anything that's large or charged, so glucose is both quite large and it's charged. So it can't freely move into a cell unless there's a doorway. So it's like the putting two magnets together that push each other away. Yeah, basically right. So glucose can't get into the cell without these transporters. Yes. And there's many different types of glucose transporters. They also help... As in categories. Yes. And they also help transport fructose and galactose as well. Uh, But basically... I want to talk very briefly about some of these glucose transporters because I think they're important. Um, And we should have a chat about exactly where these glucose transporters are and what they do. So first thing is if you take a look at these glucose transporters, there's a a fast way to remember them. And that fast way is by... (laughs) Is this your fast way? This is my fast (laughs) way, which you don't necessarily agree is a fast way. So I've got a mnemonic. And the mnemonic... I'm not disagreeing with mnemonics. But sometimes mnemonics make it more challenging to remember than... Well, let the listener decide about this. So, this is the mnemonic. Big, fierce bullies kick small, little pipsqueaks, producing nervous kids and mad fathers. I'll say it again. Big, fierce bullies kick small, little pipsqueaks, producing nervous kids and mad fathers. See, I would need a mnemonic to remember the mnemonic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't think it's that bad. Okay, so big, fierce bullies. That is glucose one transporter. That's glut one. Kick small little pipsqueaks. That's glucose two transporter, glut two. Producing nervous kids. That's glucose three transporter. And mad fathers is glucose four transporter. Now, the reason why we've got those words that those fit words into each tissue type. Glute. Yeah. So big, fierce bullies. Blood, fetus, blood, brain barrier. Glute one? Glute one is located on those tissues. So brain? Brain, blood brain barrier. Yeah. Fetus and blood. Okay. All right. When you say fetus, is it the fetus or is it the placenta? No, fetus. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It changes. Amazing. Yeah. Then you've got kick small little pip squeaks. That's kidneys, small intestines, liver, and pancreas. Mm-hmm. They have glute. Uh, glute so say those three again. Uh, kidneys, yeah. small intestines, mm-hmm. liver, and pancreas. They have GLUT2 receptors or GLUT2 transporters. Then you've got producing nervous kids. That's placenta, neurons, oh, placenta. and kidneys again because kidneys have multitude of types of glucose transporters. That's GLUT3, those three, placenta, neurons, kidneys. Then you've got mad fathers, which is muscle and fat or adipose. adipose and this is going to be GLUT4, glucose 4 transporters. Now, here's the thing. GLUT1, 2, 3, and 4... They are not sitting on the surface of the cell. Something needs to trigger them to get to the surface of the cell. And often it's insulin. So what you'll find is that insulin is required for glucose to enter a cell. That's the dogma that we teach. But in actual fact, most tissues don't require insulin. So those first three, glucose 1, glucose 2, glucose 3 transporters... Which means blood, fetus, blood brain barrier, kidneys, small intestines, when you say liver, blood, pancreas, you- placenta, neurons, and kidneys, they don't require insulin for the glucose to get into the cell via those glucose one, two, and three transporters. And when you say blood, it's blood cells. Blood so, cells. Yeah. Yes, that's right. However, glucose four transporters, muscle and adipose tissue, or muscle and fat, they do require insulin. And the insulin triggers the glucose four transporter to come to the surface so that the glucose can get in. So they're, gluco- uh, they're insulin dependent. Right, so that's, um, tar- I think fat. it's tyrosine kinase receptor, right? Which once insulin binds to that, it does intracellular processes, which pushes these receptors 
or transporters up to the surface. Is that what you said? Yes. So they're not normally there. That's what you're saying. That's right. And glucose will always move through the channel down its concentration gradient, which means these transporters are bidirectional. So if the glucose increases to a high quantity in the cell, effectively they can diffuse back out again if the channel is on the surface. But would you say that for GLUT4, which is liver, no, sorry, which is fat and muscle, yeah. that they would play a significant role in how much glucose is sucked out of the blood, though? Even though that there are only two tissue types. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, I think that's the most important point, is that a question could be raised. I said most tissues don't require insulin. So then someone could argue, then why do we need insulin? Why yeah. is it so important for blood glucose management? It's because when you look at all those different tissue types, muscle and fat that requires the insulin for the glucose getting, that makes up a huge percentage of your body mass. And so without insulin, most glucose is trapped in the bloodstream. You need the mm. insulin to get pulled out into the muscle and adipose tissue. So that's interesting because I was going to bring this in a bit later just as a, a fact, but I'll, I think I'll put it in here now. If you look at the body, the, the cells in your body, how many do we have approximately again? 30 trillion. Okay. Most of red blood cells are. Yeah, that's right. So 25 trillion cells. So that's, let's just say between 60 and 70% of your cells in your body are red blood cells. Yeah. All right. Now they don't need insulin. Correct. Right. So percentage wise if you just look at muscle and fat cells as a percentage of your whole body cells, they're not very... No. Volume-wise, though. Volume, volume And how hungry they are for glucose. Exactly. Wow. Because red blood cells, they carry oxygen. That's what most of the cell does. And they get transported through the bloodstream. Uh, metabolically, they don't, they're not necessarily overactive cell types. Yeah, I think the ATP that they need to make which is because they don't have a, a mitochondria, which we'll talk about later when we're doing um, Krebs and so forth. They're, not, they're only really making enough ATP to, for things like just making sure that their membrane is in the shape that they exactly want it. Exactly right. And then yeah. as they get a bit old, they, they lose that ability and that's why they get weird shaped. Yes. And then they get killed off in the spleen. Yes, but you think about muscle. Muscle needs a lot of And, oh, and hence why they have so much mitochondria in it, right? Exactly right. Yeah. All right. So now what we've done is we've set the scene that we're hitting the liver now because I told you we've ingested all these carbohydrates, broken them down into glucose, fructose, galactose. It's reached the liver. It needs to get inside the liver. It doesn't need insulin to do this, but it does need the glute 2 or glut 2 oh, transport. sperm. Excuse me? Sperm. Is that in your glute list? It's not a carbohydrate. <laughs> no, I mean, do, <laughs> does that need insulin to make its energy? Because it's got a crap load of uh, uh, mitochondria. Fructose, fructose, yeah. fructose, fructose, which it gets from the uh, semen. Okay. From the prostate, no, from the... Oh, uh, seminal vesicle. Seminal vesicle, yeah. Anyway, keep going. Okay. Um, glad you brought that up. So <laughs> the fructose, the uh, galactose and the glucose get into the liver cell. Now, mainly glucose is going to be using that glucose 2 transporter to get in and fructose will be using this as well predominantly and it gets into the hepatocyte, the liver cell. So the question now is what happens? Let's first focus on glucose and then we can bring those other ones in when relevant. So are we saying glucose in the cell of every cell in the body now? No, nope, uh, in the hepatocyte. Just hepatocyte. hepatocyte. Yeah. Okay, can I just ask why we just focus on hepatocyte at this point? Because the hepatocyte is the primary organ of of metabolism when it comes to, if you think about all the various metabolic processes, the liver undergoes basically all of them. Okay. So the liver is the major storage site mm -hmm. for unused glucose. Okay. Right? So it's not a muscle tissue. But the, the thing is that the liver is uh, friendly to other tissues of the body. It's generous. So the liver can store glucose if it doesn't use it and can give it to every other tissue of the body. Muscle, while it also stores glucose to a high degree, won't share it with any other tissue. Okay. So the liver is really important because all of these micronutrients go to the liver first for processing. And so the first place that glucose will be processed is going to be in the liver. All right, okay. So I think it's always good to talk about the hepatocyte. So the hepatocyte being the liver cell now has glucose in it. Glucose being glucose 6-phosphate. The question we need to ask ourselves is why do we need this glucose why are we playing around with it? Well, ultimately, what's the point of talking about cellular respiration mm. and glucose? And the analogy I, I like to use is that 
Basically, the body takes glucose as though it's a used car. It's stripping it for parts, for those parts to be used elsewhere in a more useful manner. Like an, in a di- different machine. In a different machine. To make something else. Yes. And, and so the question then is, what are we stripping from glucose? And the answer to that is we're stripping electrons. Okay. And, well, electrons and hydrogen ions. And often they're bound together to form something called hydride ions, which is a negatively charged hydrogen ion, right? So we are stripping glucose, C6H12O6. So, so this is a six-carbon six sugar? Six-carbon sugar, heaps of hydrogen available. So we can strip those hydrogens, strip the negative charged electrons as well, bound them with an intermediate chemical that can hold on to those hydrogens and electrons and take that chemical down to the electron transport chain for us to produce a huge amount of ATP. So These are lo- this is like making uh, vacuum cleaners. And the vacuum cleaners are going to be um, changing gradients of hydrogen to drive a spinning turbine to make ATP. Let's say yes. <laughs> All right. So we have the glucose. We know we need to strip it. But to strip it, just like with a car, you can't just suddenly just take the doors off and then you take this off. You, sometimes, you know, to get to the deeper parts, you need to pull things off and rearrange it. All right. And that's what we've got to do to glucose. We've got to rearrange this molecule. I don't think you've ever stripped a car before. And break it off. Yeah, yeah, I've taken the carburetor out of the um, alternator's exhaust and put it on the clutch. Um <laughs> So you got to rearrange the molecule in order to strip it properly. That's what we first need to do. So we start with glucose. And glucose needs to be rearranged into something called glucose 6. Wait, wait, wait. Before, before we get to this. So at this point now, we're purely yes. focusing on glycolysis. Correct. Yeah? Okay. So this is what, what we want to do is rearrange, rearrange glucose, strip it of as many hydrogens and electrons as we possibly can. That's glycolysis. This is one pathway. Yep. So this is this is a pathway that happens in all cells, but I know we're focusing on the liver. Yep. All cells will do this. Yep. And this will happen in the cytoplasm of cells. And it is... So it doesn't need mitochondria at this point? No mitochondria. And it doesn't need oxygen. Great point. Yeah. Two perfect points to highlight. It's not happening in the mitochondria like the other two processes we're going to talk about, which is uh, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. And it doesn't require oxygen unlike the terminal portion of... And the before we get into the nitty-gritty, how many kind of steps does this have to go through for glycolysis? Is it um, like eight or something? It is... I'm going to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Yeah, eight. Okay. Eight to nine, depending on other intermediates. So it's an eight-step process. So we're going to talk about each molecule in this eight-step process, the enzymes used and some of the important cofactors. But we're not going to do it in a way that's just boring and no. ridiculous. We're going to talk about what's really important to understand here. And can I uh, can I add just one more yeah, final point? Yeah, of course. <laughs> let's just keep making it more difficult for everybody. I think this, it's making it a bit easier. Okay, let's go. Um, another thing just to add to glycolysis in terms of an overview is that it has two phases. It has an energy-consuming phase yes. and an energy-producing phase. That's so, very important so as well. So it's like... Um, the Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike business, <laughs> <laughs> we have to invest in it. Have, before, we, have we had the, uh, the before, ATP making phase Before yet? we produce, let's say, um, any money. Yes. So we have to, you know... When will that happen? Buy certain things first, like microphones and, uh, I don't know, Cars. interfaces and stuff like oh, that yeah, yeah. before we can, I don't know, potentially make money from podcasts. Wow. But we're obviously in the um, that, Matt consuming, a- consuming phase and we haven't... <laughs> For the past <laughs> five years, yeah. <laughs> All right. this, this will make sense in a second. That's a great point. Um, and inv- yes, in glycolysis, an investment of energy must be made in the beginning for there to be an energy return. So what I'll we'll do, talk about that because you're, you're going to go through the steps really well because it's 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 cemented in your brain well, yeah, okay. not so much for me. But I'll have like the the tracker, like the clicker, yeah. and I'll tell you when we've lost energy and we're, we're, when we're making back some money here. All right. Okay. First step is glucose must be turned into something called glucose 6-phosphate. So a phosphate is a uh, phosphorus with four oxygen with a couple of negative charges. Generally, it's PO4-3 negative is phosphate. And when it's, and then, so this needs to be snapped on to this glucose molecule. Now, because glucose is a six-carbon molecule, C6H12O6, 
the phosphate needs to be attached to one of these six carbons. Now, because it's called glucose 6 phosphate, the phosphate is attached to the sixth glucose. So there you go. Where do you get the, you get the phosphate from, Michael? So, great question. It, we take this phosphate from ATP, okay. adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine is a chemical which is attached to three phosphate molecules. And as we are all probably aware, ATP is the energy currency of the body. We use ATP to do everything. And the way we use ATP is that it has three phosphates, high energy bonds. This adenosine is bound to phosphates. And if you snap a phosphate off, it releases a bit of energy that we can use to perform work. Okay. And so that's what happens here. We snap off a phosphate from ATP, give it to the glucose, snap it onto the sixth carbon, and now we've got glucose six phosphate. But what have we just used For, up? First investment, one loss. Exactly. So we're negative. We're in the we're in the red by one. We are. Okay. Now there was an enzyme that needed to do this. A kinase. That's right. And so the, there's two major types of enzymes that do this depending on where you are. Glucokinase and hexokinase. We're in the liver. So we're using glucokinase. Hexokinase happens in other tissues of the body. You cool with that? Yep. And I think the important point there is all the other tissue bar the liver. Is it just the liver that does it? And does kid- what? Maybe kidney as well. Is it what's the other what are the what are the organs what are the tissue types that have hexokinase? Is that all body? Uh, all body. Like, okay, yeah. glucokinase? Just the liver. Just the liver. And the important point there, I think, if I remember back to biochemistry, this is now glucokinase is reversible. So it can repackage glucose 6-phosphate back into glucose so the liver can pump that glucose into the blood if you are in a fasting state. But not in other tissues. Not in other tissues. So the point here is with hexokinase, you've now locked the glucose molecule into this process and it can't reverse its way out yes it's an irreversible step yeah Yeah. so and generally when you add a phosphate it tends it tends to be an irreversible step okay tends so okay so this first step irreversible and we now produce glucose 6 phosphate through the enzyme glucokinase now we've got glucose 6 phosphate we need to turn it into something called fructose 6 phosphate so fructose we spoke about fructose as being one of the monomers similar to glucose. In actual fact, if you write glucose down, and I said it's C6, H12O6, if you were to write fructose down, Matt, do you know what it would be? C6, H12O6. Glucose and fructose are chemically identical in regards to their formula, but... They don't look the same. They're just rearranged. That's it. It's just the... So they're the isomers for me, that. They other. are. They are isomers of one another. And so to turn glucose... 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, you don't add or remove anything, you just rearrange. And when you rearrange a molecule, you either use an enzyme called an isomerase or a mutase. Okay. And in this case, we're using an isomerase. And so it's called phosphoglucose because it's a phosphorylated glucose molecule. Isomerase. Sorry. Easy. Okay. So we've just rearranged it. That's all you need to know. But the phosphate is still on the 6th carbon. Now we've got fructose 6-phosphate. Are you cool with that? I'm... All right, this is a reversible step, so you're aware. Now, from fructose 6-phosphate, we need to go down to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So, we were fructose 6-phosphate. Now, we're going to be fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So you need another phosphate. For bisphosphate, you've got to add another phosphate. Where do we get that phosphate from? another business investment. That's right. One more ATP comes in, you snap off a phosphate, it's now ADP, and you've attached this phosphate to the first carbon of the glucose molecule. So so now if you have a look, you've got a phosphate on the first carbon, a phosphate on the sixth carbon, and that's why it's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now it's not biphosphate, that would mean that the phosphates are next to each other. It's bisphosphate, which tells you there's a space between the two phosphates. And that's a big space. Big space. One and six. That's right. Okay. Now, the enzyme here is called phosphofructokinase. Okay. Now, it's a kinase because you're playing around with phosphate. Anytime you hear kinase, phosphate. Remember the first step? Glucokinase. Yep. Here, phosphofructokinase. Playing around with phosphate. This is irreversible as well. Yeah. And so this step is three, can't go back. And I'll bring in a point here is that this is a rate limiting step for, gl- for a glycolysis, which means that... You can do certain things. There's certain intermediates 
that will play around with the speed of this enzyme. What was this enzyme called again? Uh, phosphofructose kinase. So can I just call it PFK1? Well, that's the thing. It's phosphofructose kinase 1 because okay. there's a phosphofructose two. kinase 2. Yep. Yeah. So some of the things that will slow this enzyme's activity down would be ATP. Right. So if the cell is energised, like got a lot of energy already, which would be seen in the presence of ATP, it will slow this enzyme down because it's basically saying, look, we've already got a lot of energy here. Relax. Stop. We don't need to make more. Just slow down a bit. Yeah, generally speaking, if you have a high abundance of downstream products, they tend to be negative regulators of what's happening upstream. So ATP is a common negative regulator for upstream metabolic processes. And the other one is uh, citrate, which is a byproduct of the Krebs cycle. That's right. And so if that starts building up, which would just suggest again, things are in overabundance downstream, feeds back up and says, slow down because we're, we're pretty busy down downstream. Yeah, that's exactly right. The only thing that uh, speeds up this enzyme is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is a kind of a side... Um, production line. I don't really want to talk more about anything more there unless yeah. you want to add something. But just as a side point, this enzyme PFK1 can be sped up by a close intermediate, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Sorry, uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Yeah, I think its job, and I could be wrong, but I think its job is it actually pulls, helps facilitate the uh, kinase process. So it helps to facilitate adding the phosphate group. So if that's in a high abundance, then the uh, uh, phosphofructokinase will work quite efficiently. Yep. Is it just an, uh, as a side point to add here, because we did speak about galactose and fructose, which are the other monosaccharides, can we just say these? this is the kind of region where fructose and galactose will come into glycolysis? Yeah, so generally speaking... In the liver, that is. Yeah, so fructose is coming a little bit later. Okay. Um, so... Basically, fructose is coming in at the next step okay. of glycolysis, uh, but galactose has already come in into... Uh, glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate, right. that's right. All right, so now we've got fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we've got a phosphate on the first carbon, phosphate on the sixth carbon, or the last carbon. So now we have this enzyme called Eldose, which basically just snaps it in half. So now you've got two three-carbon molecules. Okay, so you, we've got a... A six-carbon molecule that we've just cut right in half, yep. and now we've got two three-carbon molecules. Yep, and one the f one of them has a phosphate on the first carbon, and the other one has a phosphate on the last carbon, which in this case will now be the third carbon. So we've got a phosphate on carbon one and a phosphate on carbon three of the other. So the one that's got the phosphate on the first carbon is called dihydroacetone, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, right? Dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And the other one is called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is So glyceraldehyde is the molecule now with three carbons. Three phosphate because it's got the phosphate on the third carbon. So the Eldose enzyme is what's, has what, it, it performed this splitting process. Okay. But ultimately we want to turn the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, the one with the phosphate on the first carbon, into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And we do that through an enzyme called triose phosphate isomerase. Again, isomerase because it's just rearranging where that phosphate okay. sits, right? Okay. And then what we end up having is two molecules, so two three-carbon oh, molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay. You cool with that? Yep. Now, here's where it starts to... Here's where we start to make uh, a return on our investment. Yes. Right? Now, we're talking about where does fructose come in. Fructose actually jumps in at this step to become dihydroxyacetone phosphate which then gets transferred into glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate through triose phosphate isomerase. That's where fructose comes in. Cool with yeah, that? Yes. All right. So anyway, we've got glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. It's a three-carbon molecule mm -hmm. with phosphate on the third carbon. We have two sets of them. And using an enzyme called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So when you hear about dehydrogenase, you need to start thinking about a new molecule that's come in now. A cofactor called NAD+. Okay, so this is going to be uh, part of the machinery because you spoke about the car. Yep. This is going to be making the vacuum cleaners. 
and I'll talk about it later. This is uh, now grabbing a hold of the important components that we need to make energy down the track. So, yeah. so well, actually, no, I, sh- I shouldn't say it's making the vacuum cleaners. It's uh, giving the electricity for the vacuum cleaners. Yeah, it's it's. I, I don't know how complex we're going to make the analogy, but I think that it, but it's it's taking the important parts and carrying it to where they need to go. Okay. So now let's think about this. NAD plus nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Important. It's actually coming from a certain B vitamin. Do you know which B vitamin it comes from? Can you keep on the name or the number? The number. Uh, three. Three. Yeah. B three. Vitamin B3 is important to make nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So what is, what is B3 called? Nicotinamide, isn't it? Niacin? Niacin, sorry. Okay. Yes, niacin. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, I'm just going to say NAD, uh, is formed from niacin, right. which is B3. So you need B3 for this process. All right. It's called NAD+. Plus. It has a positive charge associated with it. What NAD+, plus does... And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, but it's this is probably the most important part of this entire podcast. Wow. Yep. Big call. No joke. No joke. So NAD plus, it's going to steal a hydrogen from glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Now a hydrogen, if you look at the periodic table, is which element? Which number element? The first. The first. So what does that tell you about what it's made up of? Just one proton. And electron one electron so on the periodic table all those elements are neutral hydrogen b number one has one proton and one electron those charges balance each other out the proton in the core is positive the electron flying around the outside is negative so as an example helium which is number two two protons positive in the middle two electrons flying around the outside neutral let's take the hydrogen nad plus steals a hydrogen from glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and becomes NADH plus. Right. But here's the thing. It doesn't want that plus. So what it does is it steals another hydrogen from glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So pulls it off, but takes the electron from that hydrogen, keeps it, and throws the rest the pro- away. The proton away. The proton away into the solution. Okay. Now, a proton is simply H+. plus. A proton is a hydrogen ion. Mm-hmm. So in this process, NAD plus steals two hydrogen, one full hydrogen with the positive proton and negative electron, and just the electron from the second hydrogen and then tosses the other hydrogen into the solution, so the cytoplasm, which has a positive charge with it, making the cytoplasm a little bit acidic because... Hydrogen ions, H+, plus, is what makes a solution acidic. Okay. So this process makes the solution slightly acidic. So, so what is the equation here? NAD plus turns into NADH plus hydrogen ion, a free hydrogen right, ion. Right, and so that will be the NADH will be used a bit later on when we get to the ETC. Yes, so what the NADH ultimately has is one hydrogen that has two electrons. Okay. Right? So now we've just... We've got those parts that we want for later. Because glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we've got two of them, we actually produced two NADH molecules. We need yes, to keep yes, that in mind, right? right? Yeah. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay. Now, the thing is that going from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate into the next molecule, uh, which is extremely important, what is the next molecule? Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate turns into? One... 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Okay. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, it needs to add another phosphate. So an inorganic phosphate comes in from the cytoplasm and just binds into it. So now you've got a phosphate on the first carbon and the third carbon. But we lose one, though, no? right? So we this is a gaining step rather uh, than a losing step. So we actually pull a phosphate off it to make it into... Three phosphoglycerate. Well, that's the next step. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've gone from glyceraldehyde three phosphate. We've added a phosphate to give us glyceraldehyde one three bisphosphate. We've also stolen two hydrogens and an electron and two electrons. Right. One of those hydrogens in the solution, but one of those hydrogens bound to NADH. And because there's two molecules of them, we've done this twice over. Okay. So now we've got the one three the glyceraldehyde one three bisphosphate. Yep. 
Now, the enzyme we used here, I said, was glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So when you hear the dehydrogenase, think the NAD plus process. So to go from this step to the next, we have to, like you said, take that phosphate away. So that we're then left with 3-phosphoglycerate. So simply, the 3-carbon molecule, we pop the phosphate off the first one, and we've just got the phosphate left on the third one now. Right, and so this is the first point where we make a bit of money back. Yes, so if we're taking the phosphate off, something needs to pop it off, and that's ADP. Yeah. Takes it, adds the third and final phosphate to it, so it's ATP. So now we've just generated ATP energy. And because we've got two of these, we've made two molecules of ATP. So that's we're, right. So we're now back to even. That's Yes, good point. Back to even. So we haven't lost anything at this point exactly. in our investments. And what we've made is 3-phosphoglycerate, a 3-carbon molecule with a phosphate on the third carbon, and we've got two of them, right? So to go from 3-phosphoglycerate, we actually go to 2-phosphoglycerate. We need to rearrange where the phosphate sits, and we use this not using an isomerase but using a mutase called phosphoglycerate mutase. Okay. And so now what we've got is the phosphate on the second carbon. Done. 2-phosphoglycerate. Next step is to add an oxygen between the phosphate and that second carbon. And we use an enzyme called enolase to do this. So now we've got... So where's the oxygen? Water? Yes. Comes from water. Okay. Yep. And so now you've got a three-carbon molecule with an oxygen bound to the second carbon and a phosphate bound to that oxygen. And what we've just developed is something called phosphoenol pyruvate using the enzyme enolase. Okay. We're at the second last step. Right. Now we're going into the last step to go from phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate itself. The s final step of glycolysis, arguably. Some say lactate's the final step, but we can discuss that later. To go from phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate, we use an enzyme called pyruvate kinase. What does that tell you? If there's a kinase. Uh, takes a phosphate off. Takes a phosphate off. So we're removing that phosphate from the oxygen molecule, which is bound to the second carbon, and giving it to ADP to form more energy, ATP. And then we're left with pyruvate. So we've made some money back. Yep, made money back, and we've now made two molecules of a three-carbon molecule called pyruvate. Okay, so the take-home point at this stage is that from one molecule of glucose that has come into the cell, and it really doesn't matter what cell it is. I know we've focused on the liver cell, but any cell in the body will go through all this. One molecule of glucose, which is a six-carbon molecule, all those steps that we just mentioned, and the end result is we've come out at the end with two molecules of ATP. Four. As a win? Four. Or oh, four. Yep. Come out with, we lost two, gained four, and gained two NADH. Oh, okay. I thought we, we just had a, a two because the, the first ATP Talk win. about net or gross? Net. Okay, then yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've got a 2 ATP net, plus we've also got a 2 NADH net, net and we've got two molecules of pyruvate kinase. Just pyruvate. Oh, that's right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Going back to pyruvate kinase, is a, this is also a rate limit in step, and mm -hmm. so some things can speed this up and slow this down. Okay, one of, the, one of the things, well, actually two things that will slow it down again is ATP, but another interesting one is alanine, which is an amino acid. Do you want to quickly mention why this may be the case? Right. So uh, this is an important step and it's uh, a little bit confusing, but let's try and explain it. In muscle tissue, obviously glucose is used through glycolysis to make pyruvate produce ATP. The thing is that muscle uses a lot of proteins. And it doesn't just use the protein and keep using it for your whole life. When you use a protein, uh, it tends to break down and have a byproduct. And that byproduct is ammonia. So muscle metabolism has ammonia as a byproduct. Ammonia can be toxic when it... Excess. Excess. So we need a way of getting rid of that ammonia. But you can't just throw it straight from the muscle into the bloodstream to get to the liver for the liver to deal with it because that's what the liver does. It detoxifies these metabolic byproducts. Another reason why the liver deals with a lot of these biochemistry-based uh, yep. processes, biochemical processes. So muscle breaks down to the amino acids. The amino acids break down to the ammonia. Now, here's the thing. 
ammonia is bound up by an intermediate product called glutamate. Now, if you're producing pyruvate from glycolysis, pyruvate and glutamate can come together and swap things with each other. The glutamate forms alpha-ketoglutarate, which can jump into the Krebs cycle, which will be something we'll talk about in a second. That's great. We can utilize that to make ATP. And the pyruvate turns into alanine. Alanine can jump into the bloodstream. That's very safe. Safe. Very easy. And jump into the liver. Here in the liver, the alanine will turn back into pyruvate, but we'll have to steal some alpha-ketoglutarate from the Krebs cycle to turn that into glutamate. Now, remember, the glutamate's holding on to this ammonia. Okay. But the thing is that the liver can deal with ammonia now. So the glutamate hands the ammonia to the liver and undergoes the urea cycle to produce urea. Which is a safer intermediate to get rid of through the kidneys. Exactly. Throws it back into the bloodstream, kidneys filter it, you pee it out. Mm. So at the so, end of the day, what so are we So basically, saying? alanine here would be suggestive that the muscles are secreting excessive amounts of alanine, which would be possibly that the muscles are in a fasting state. So they're trying to make... Um, their own energy through amino acids. Mm -hmm. And so they don't get toxic buildup of nitrogen or, as you said, ammonia. They try to get rid of an amino acid being... I'd say just a post-absorptive state. You could okay. say... Okay, only because fasting has such a charged term now. Okay, right. People think, you know... A, non, a non-fed state. Yeah. Okay, and that, so this alanine comes back into the liver and therefore to prevent back backlogging, it slows down pruvate kinase to stop, you know, too much being built up. Yeah, because if you think about it, if if the liver is trying to make pyruvate through glycolysis, yet a whole bunch of alanines jumping in that will also make pyruvate, there's a competition. And so the alanine is going to be a negative regulator of glycolysis and glycolysis will likely be a negative regulator of alanine. Yep. So, you know, th that makes total sense because you need a homeostatic regulation of pyruvate production. But regardless, now we have pyruvate. Yes. Is this where we're at? Yes. All right. So we're still in the cytosol. We're not in the mitochondria yet, right? And so for some cells, this is the end. Like we spoke about red blood cells. Doesn't, yeah, true. Doesn't go beyond this because yep. they've got no they've got no mitochondria. So that's the end point for them. They've the, made their ATP and that's enough for their function. Yes. And in another podcast, we're going to talk about pyruvate going down another pathway to produce something called lactate. Uh, and how lactate can be utilised uh, in anaerobic states, so no oxygen, uh, but also in you know normal metabolic states as well. But that's going to be another podcast because this is not the pathway we're going down. We're continuing through cellular respiration. We ultimately want to get to the mitochondria, but we need to take pyruvate and we need to turn it into something called acetyl-CoA so okay. it can jump into the mitochondria. Right, and so, so this is an intermediate step for it to be able to have the ability to transport to the inner depths of the mitochondria. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's good. Because the mitochondria has two membranes, right? It does. And so it needs to get across both to do its Krebs. Thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So what happens is pyruvate, remember two molecules, need to turn into acetyl-CoA. So I'm going to stop saying two molecules now. All you know, you just know that we've got... Pyruvate. Yeah, pyruvate. All right, so pyruvate needs to turn into acetyl-CoA through an enzyme uh, called pyruvate. Two steps though, right? Well, it's, there's actually a lot of components here. Okay. It's pyruvate dehydrogenase complex because there's a lot of things being involved here. But ultimately what we want to do is we need – pyruvate's a three-carbon molecule. Yep. We need to turn it into a two-carbon molecule. Okay. So we need to get rid of a carbon. That's the first thing. We need to add an, a CoA to it which is just a little side group that we need to add. And we need to pull off some hydrogen and electrons. So a lot of mm -hmm. things need to happen. So here's where we start to bring in some more B vitamins and derivatives of B vitamins. So we bring in, in this process of turning pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we need vitamin B1. Thionine. Vitamin B3. Niacin. And vitamin B5. Pentathenic acid. Okay. All right. So let's think about it like this. Vitamin B1, its derivative here is thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP. It helps us play around with the carbons. 
That's how you think about TPP. Pantothenic acid also helps in this process as well. And vitamin B5, uh, sorry, that is B5. Vitamin B3 is the NAD+. So first step, we need to pull off the carbon. We use B1 and B5. So thiamine, pyrophosphate and pantothenic acid. We pluck the carbon off, snap it together with some oxygen. It forms carbon dioxide. We breathe that out. Okay. Done. There's the carbon. Buggers off, right? This is a decarboxylase process. That's when you take a carbon off, decarboxylase. So we've done that. Now B3 comes along in the form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD+. Pulls off two hydrogen. One it keeps with an extra electron, like I said before, and the other it tosses off as a uh, hydrogen ion into the solution. So that's more pH change. That's right. Also, in doing this, we've you know we've stolen hydrogens and electrons for later. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and because point. and because we've got two pyruvate, we're making we're doing this twice over. So yeah. we've just made two NAD yeah. H. The other thing is we need to add a, a, a CoA to it, and this is also through the help of pantothenic acid, right? Snaps B5. That, yep, snaps that CoA to the side. So now we've got a two carbon molecule with a CoA attached to it, and we've produced two NADH. Brilliant. Through the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Using three B vitamins. So this is why these B vitamins are known as carbohydrate kind of vitamins, right, for energy? Yeah, the B vitamins are are so... Pretty much every B vitamin is involved in some biochemical pathway associated with the Krebs cycle. Yeah, okay. Super important. And there's just an example of three. So now we've got uh, two acetyl-CoA molecules. This is a molecule that can now jump into the mitochondria. And now we enter... So at this point, it this is still happening in the cytoplasm? Or yes. Or yes, and now the acetyl-CoA jumps into the mitochondria. Okay. Right. So, so... Yeah, okay. Let's talk about what happens now. We now enter a cycle that has three different names. The Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle... Or citric acid cycle. Or the citric acid cycle. We're going to say Krebs. I know we should be moving away from using... What's it called? Uh, Pseudonyms. uh, Yeah. Uh, Sure. But everyone knows... Things named after people. Yeah. But look, let's let's keep calling it Krebs for the time being because everyone really knows it as the Krebs cycle. But if you want to say tricarboxylic acid cycle or citric acid cycle, go for it. So what we need to talk about is that the acetyl-CoA in this cycle binds to something called oxaloacetate, which is actually a four-carbon molecule. Okay. So uh, the two-carbon acetyl-CoA binds to the four-carbon oxaloacetate to form a six-carbon. Uh, six, yep. Yeah, a bit slow on that one, which is called citrate. The enzyme that we use is citrate synthase. Yeah, can, we just, can we quickly just mention here, I know we're going to do a separate podcast on it, but how... The oxaloacetate is going to play an important role in what happens to acetyl-CoA. And so, at least in the liver, if we are deficient in oxaloacetate, then we may start building up acetyl-CoA and we need to, because we can't drive this citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle anymore because we're deficient in oxaloacetate, then the liver has to repackage the acetyl-CoA into other intermediates which is generally referred to the ketone bodies. I know we'll come back to that, but yeah. is that okay just to mention? Well, I guess I already not have. really because y- you can't just say deficient in oxaloacetate with saying why we're deficient in oxaloacetate. Just, okay. So in the metabolic state that the liver would be in, it would be trying to, let's say it's a, f- a fasting state or a non-fed state. It would be using oxaloacetate to make new glucose, so gluconeogenesis. And so because it's, um, busy doing that, it doesn't have enough oxaloacetate in the hepatocyte cell to keep driving... To bind with acetyl-CoA yeah. to, to keep driving this uh, Krebs cycle. Yeah. yeah. So or, we'll or at least the, the point here is acetyl-CoA st- is starting to build up and the way that the liver deals with excessive acetyl-CoA, presumably in the mitochondria, is to repackage it into ketone bodies. Yeah. But yeah. that's going to be the focus of yeah. another... But the side point I was just going to add here is there could be other states that would also increase acetyl-CoA 
amount. So the just the not the production of it, but just the the number of acetylcholine, and that could be just through lots of fatty acid entering it, or even alcohol alcohol would go down this pathway as well, which could then lead to the liver doing different things with acetylcholine. Yep. Now forget all that. Because that will be the focus of another. It's, it's, it's important to mention, but forget that because we're just talking about glucose metabolism and how glucose is ultimately moving down this pathway. So now we've got acetyl-CoA bound to oxaloacetate called citrate, six carbon molecule because oxaloacetate is four, acetyl-CoA is two, and the enzyme we use is citrate synthase. So now with the citrate, it needs to turn into something called isocitrate. And isocitrate uh, basically is just... a you know, it's a rearrangement of citrate. So it uses uh, an aconitase to do so. So the aconitase just rearranges citrate to isocitrate, done. Still a six carbon molecule. From isocitrate to the next step, which is alpha ketoglutarate, this is important. We need to turn it from a six carbon molecule to a five carbon molecule. And we do it by removing carbon dioxide again. And so if we do that, it's a dehydrogenase step. Uh, and remember, dehydrogenase NADH, so I should say, sorry, it's a decarboxylation step, but the enzyme is a dehydrogenase because we're also stealing more hydrogen with electrons. Which is going to be important for those electron carrier things. Yep. So isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, we pop off a carbon, so it goes from a six carbon molecule to a five in the form of carbon dioxide, and we take NAD+, plus, steal two hydrogen with an, uh, an, an extra electron, toss one of those hydrogens in the solution as a hydrogen ion, and now we're left with NADH. And now the molecule we're left with is alpha ketoglutarate, a five-carbon molecule. Awesome. Alpha ketoglutarate... Can I just add one point here? Yeah. Well, it's actually an overview point. Can I still say it? Go for it. Um, just as a Krebs cycle, it's an eight-step process or cycle. It has to go through eight things. Um, but half of them are dehydrogenase steps, which means that... 50% of this whole thing is creating these things we're just talking about now, which is electron carriers. Good point. Yeah, the, the whole purpose, again, is to pluck hydrogens and electrons from these molecules. And the Krebs cycle is a really efficient uh, cycle to do this. So basically, we've just done the first uh, step of pulling off these hydrogens and electrons from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. The next step is very similar to the one we just went through where we go from a five carbon now to a four carbon. So we pull off another carbon dioxide. Yep. Um, and mm. yep, pull off another carbon dioxide and we take more hydrogens with electrons through NAD plus, again, producing more NADH. But this time we add a CoA to it. So because we're adding a CoA, because we're pulling carbon dioxides off and because we're using NAD plus, again, we're using vitamin B1, B3, B5 in this process, right? So we're using thiamine pyrophosphate, pentathenic acid, and niacin. So now what we've got is something going from alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA. Okay. And the enzyme we used was alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase because again, went from NAD plus to NADH2. So succinyl CoA, because it's got the CoA to it, we need to go from succinyl CoA into something called succinate. And we need to do this by doing a couple of important things. One, we need to pop off the CoA. Again, strangely enough. So we pop the CoA off. We also need to give it a... Phos uh, remove a phosphate. Remove a phosphate from it. And so, interestingly, we remove the phosphate by giving it to ultimately ADP to form ATP, but we use it through an intermediate product, which is GDP. Yeah. So pop a phosphate off. Give it from GDP to form GTP, which then pops it off to give it to ADP to give it to Okay, ATP. So it's like intermediate. Exactly. Middleman. Exactly Mid Middle right. person. It, perfect. Uh, and that's using the enzyme succinyl-CoA synthetase. So we go from succinyl-CoA to succinate, four carbon with a CoA to just a four carbon with no CoA. And we've produced ATP. That's, that's important. And is, it, is there cofactors important here? Like we saw in the uh, proof about dehydrogenase? Like is there important um, vitamins look, at this point? Or is it the, was the whole Krebs cycle pretty... The whole Krebs cycle obviously dependent. utilizes it. But yes, I'd, 
popping off the CoA, I'm not sure what um, enzyme would be utilised. But the reason why the phosphate comes off here without the use of a coenzyme is when the CoA pops off because of succinyl CoA synthetase. So this enzyme pops the CoA off. Energy is released by popping off the CoA. And that energy is the phosphate, okay. which can be stolen by GDP. Okay. Usually another enzyme like would come in like a kinase, right? To help play around with the phosphate. But there's no kinase here. And the reason why is because GDP could steal it by piggybacking on the energy that was released when the CoA popped off. Okay. All right. So now we've got succinate, four carbon molecule. The succinate goes to fumarate. And here, we actually don't use NAD plus to steal hydrogens and electrons. We use FAD. And FAD, see there's no plus there? Flavonine or something? F flavonide adenine dinucleotide. So this is going to be B2? Yes, B2. This is, yeah, vitamin B2. Perfect. So now we've used B1, B2, B3, B5. FAD does the same as NAD plus, right? Just carries the hydrogen. Sorry. Shoots a hydrogen off and carries an electron. Well, n- not really. So what it does <laughs> is because remember NAD plus yeah, yeah. needed to steal a full hydrogen, a second hydrogen which it buggered off but stole yep. the electron from yep. it. Yep. Here we don't need to steal that additional electron. So FAD just steals two hydrogens, both of them with their electrons. Oh, uh-huh, okay. Right? And so that's why it's F- it becomes goes from FAD to FADH2. Two. And again, because there's two molecules of all these things, we've just made two molecules of FADH2. Okay. Again, this uses the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase. We go from fumarate to malate now, using the enzyme fumarase and by adding some water to it. Or fumarate hydrase. Yeah, you could say Either yeah, way. fumarase, fumarate so hydrase, it, doesn't matter. It utilizes, yeah, so it uses water here. Yep. And then from malate we go to oxaloacetate, which we said we utilise to fuse with acetyl-CoA. So this and brings and back to the start of the cycle. Yes, and to go from malate to oxaloacetate, we use a dehydrogenase, malate dehydrogenase, and we use the NAD plus again to create two molecules of NADH plus hydrogen. So at, at the end of this whole process, right, we've created four carbon dioxide molecules, Okay. six NADH molecules. Is that for two pyruvates? Yes. Or, so for... For each, sorry, for each acetyl-CoA, which we made a bit earlier from pyruvate, we make three NADH and one FADH2 yep. and one GDP. Or ATP. And we, two molecules of CO2. That's right. And we use that one bit of water, one yes. molecule of water. But what you could say, because effectively from one molecule of glucose. Yeah, you double it. You double it. So from one molecule of glucose, you've produced four carbon dioxide, six NADH, two FADH2, and two ATP molecules. So, and this is in this, this is in the inner. Uh, what do you call it? The, not the cytoplasm of the mitochondria, but the inner part. The equivalent of yeah. of that. So what we've basically done. And would you say um, because the mitochondria is proposed that it's come from a an early bacteria, oh yeah, that bacteria would be doing this themselves for energy? Yeah. So within their cytoplasm, and then they would be moving stuff across their well, membrane, which well, we'll discuss in a second. Yeah. So the mitochondria is synonymous in a way with current bacteria. So th- what we're about to talk about with the electron transport chain embedded in the membrane, bacteria just have that embedded in their normal membranes. Right. right? They don't have the mitochondria because they are the mitochondria. Right. All right, so just to highlight, because this is extremely important, what we've now produced that we're going to utilise to make the new fantastic thing, right, which is going to be ATP in this process, right? Stripping the car, using that analogy, right? From glycolysis, we've produced two NADH. From the transfer, the transformation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we've produced two more NADH. And through the Krebs cycle, we've produced six NADH and two FADH2. So ultimately, we've produced... And a lot of hydrogen, which will be, become important in a second as well. 
Well, that's part of this, yeah, yeah. right? So we produce 10 NADH2. Oh, sorry, 10 NADH and 2 FADH2. Okay. Which, like you just said, the importance of these molecules is they're holding on to a whole bunch of hydrogen ions and a whole bunch of electrons, which we're going to be pulling off them now. Yes. And this is now where we get to the inner membrane of the mitochondria and embedded in the inner membrane, because like you said, there's two membranes, are a whole bunch of proteins. Okay, and lipids. And lipids. Yeah. Do you want to go through them? Do you want to just name them or do you want to just do it sequentially? No, let's line, name them as an overview and then we'll... All right, make do you want to do that? Well, okay, sure. So the, f- <laughs> the first in the line is complex one. Do we yep. need to tell you any more than that? Not really. Okay. Complex one, which is um, some of these uh, molecules span the whole membrane. So they're an integral protein, I guess you'd say. So yep. they go across the whole length of the membrane. Of, whilst, as in both inner and outer? Well, they have the ability to to span the, uh, the cytoplasm of the mitochondria to the space between... Oh, to the intermembrane space. That's it. That yes. We go okay. intermembrane yeah. space. So they're an, in, they're an integral inner membrane protein is yeah. what you're saying. Yes. And that's important because they're going to be going to be used for trans- transport, transporting, should I say, hydrogen ions or protons. Yeah. Which is going to be the, va- the vacuum cleaner analogy that we're going to use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So complex... So complex one. Complex one. Now, complex two, is that also called coenzyme Q or is co- coenzyme Q just a part of it? Uh, coenzyme Q is just intimately related with complex two, but okay. it is not complex two. Okay, complex three is the next one along. Yep. That's also one that spans the, the length of the membrane. Yep. Then we go to cytochrome C. Yep. And which one's the fat out of these ones? So most of these are proteins, but one of, is it cytochrome C that's a fat or the lipid? Not sure. Okay. Not sure. I'll find out in a second. And then complex four, which is the last of them that will be carrying the electrons which is important, again, to drive the concentration gradient of hydrogen. Yep. And then the last step will be the ATA, ATP synthase, which is kind of like the turbine that will be using the gradient of hydrogen to essentially make the ATP. Yeah, to make all that energy. Yeah. All right, do you want me to go through it? Yes. Okay, so what's now happened is we've got all those NADH and FADH2 holding onto the hydrogen, holding onto the electrons. What happens is the NADH, first of all, will approach complex one, the very first integral protein here in what's called the electron transport chain. It's giving you an indication what's happening. It's transporting electrons along a chain of proteins. So NADH hands off. It goes in the opposite direction to what it did originally. So NADH turns to NADH. Uh, sorry, NADH turns into NAD+, plus, handing off an the, electron. the hydrogens and the electron. Now, it gives the electron to complex one. And when you give an electron to this protein, it excites it. And you excite it so much that it generates this force that can take the hydrogen ion, the H+, and pump it across into the intermembrane space, the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So that's my first vacuum cleaner. That's the first vacuum cleaner. So what we've done, effectively, is taken the hydrogens and the electrons from NADH excited the complex one with the electron, which has allowed for us to pump the hydrogen ion into the mem- into membrane space. And I think this complex one is a derivative of, again, uh, B2. So it's a rubber flavin complex. It is, yes. And it's got an iron and a sulfur incorporated within it. That's exactly right, yep. yep. So, Th- then so, so now we can move it on. So the electron... Well, the electron's stuck. Okay. The it, it, it needs to be taken away and it gets taken away by coenzyme Q10, which is sort of sitting next door to it. And it takes that electron and it passes it on. Now, before we, let's just say coenzyme Q10 is holding onto this electron. Let's just keep it there for the time being. And this is a, sm- it's, it's a small enzyme that's in the middle of the membrane. So it's not yeah, spanning it's not it. it's not spanning the whole distance. It's kind of right. sitting in front of or on top of complex two. Now, or near it at least. Yeah. Now, complex two, it doesn't take NADH. It takes FADH2. And it does the same thing. Strips it of the hydrogens and the electrons. But here's the thing. 
It gets excited by the electrons, but it doesn't have a vacuum cleaner to suck the hydrogens yes. across into the intermembrane space. So the hydrogen ions are sort of stuck in the cytoplasm of the mitochondria or whatever the term is that we use, right? The inner space of the mitochondria. But so the second complex is still excited by the electron, which it hands off to coenzyme Q10. So now what we've got is complex one and complex two have both handed coenzyme Q10 the electrons. It can then hand it off to complex three. And can I just make one point here? Go for it. This this particular complex two is also the same complex that's in the one of the steps of Krebs. So this is succinate dehydrogenase as yeah. well. So this complex two also plays a role in um, the Krebs cycle, and that would be uh, kind of intimate in terms of the speed of the both the Krebs cycle, but also the electron transport chain because they are, have a shared enzyme. And it makes sense because the succinate dehydrogenase was used at the step to go from succinate to fumarate, which is where we turned FAD to FADH2. Yep. We're just using it in the opposite direction yep. now to go from FADH2 to FAD. So, quick recap. NADH has handed off hydrogens and electrons to complex one. FADH2 is handed off hydrogens and electrons to complex 2. Complex 1 gets excited by the electron, pumps hydrogens across into the intermembrane space. Complex 2 gets excited by the electron, doesn't have the vacuum cleaner to do that same thing. But both hand the electrons off to an intermediate, which is coenzyme Q10. Which is the lipid. That's the, This is the only lipid okay. of this complex. Yep. Great. Now, coenzyme Q10 will hand the electron off. So we're playing hot potato with electrons now takes the electron, hands it off to complex 3, which has an, I, an iron ion, <laughs> Fe3+, plus, which takes the electrons and basically gets excited and pumps more hydrogen ions across into the intermembrane space. Second vacuum cleaner. Second vacuum cleaner. So only complex 1, complex 3 at the moment are vacuum cleaners, not complex 2. And when we say vacuum cleaners, what, 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 what's, what's been sucked up is essentially the hydrogen ions from the inner part of the... the um, the membrane. mitochondria to the inter... Membrane space. Yeah, between okay. the inner and outer membrane. Yeah. Uh, if you have an image in front of you, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> the electron then gets transferred across to cytochrome C. And is this where it's utilising iron, the change in uh, electrons in the iron? So, uh, so what is it, Fe3 iron plus is, to yeah, Fe2 plus? 2 plus, yeah. yeah. So there's iron ions in uh, complex 3, cytochrome C and complex 4. So they all use the iron to transfer the electrons. So basically complex three throws the electrons across to cytochrome C, which throws the electron across to complex four, which gets excited and pumps more hydrogen ions across. I've, so got, I've got complex four as copper, not iron. They really? May, they may have both. Okay, maybe it does. I'm not sure. But all I know is, well, not all I know, but one thing I know is complex one, th uh, three, and four they get excited by the electrons to pump hydrogens across into the intermembrane space. Yep. Now, very finally, complex four has the electrons. What does it do with it? It gives it to molecular oxygen, which splits the oxygen apart. Remember, oxygen is O2. Splits it apart so it's just O, but a negatively charged O, which then binds with some of the spare hydrogen ions to form water. Right. Makes sense. Yep. Negative oxygen, positive hydrogen, enough come together to form H2O. They all have partial charges with them, so we produce water. So that this is why oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. That's what it's termed in this process. It's and the last place that the electrons go is water. And hence why you need oxygen for cellular respiration. Exactly. So if you were hypoxic here, this process would be... In problem well think about Trouble. it if you didn't have the oxygen to finally take those electrons to turn to water which we know that we can excrete very easily or utilize right the electrons are stuck in complex four and then they'll back up into complex three and back up into cytochrome c and back up into complex two and back up into uh coenzyme q10 and then back up into complex one which means it backs up into krebs cycle which means it back and so forth so this is the reason why, you, like you said, you need oxygen in this process. And this is actually beautiful because you can say that all this whole process of stealing electrons and hydrogens ends up making water 
which is nice. So through metabolism, you make water. Um, but the whole purpose of it is to simply pump hydrogen ions into the membrane that sits between the inner and outer membrane of the mitochondria. The space. Oh, the space. The space. So now that space becomes membrane. highly concentrated with hydrogen ions. I think like 10 to the negative 10 or something hydrogen ion concentration. It's twice as concentrated as it would normally be now with all these hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space. And with the whole process that we've gone through today, glycolysis, Krebs, and now here, is the majority of water made at this point? Yeah. Okay. So going back to biochemistry, I think I did an assignment. I can't remember the details of it. So but it didn't do very well? Um, pro- oh, no, I think it went okay. But the question was basically asking from if you had this type of meal – and they gave it in grams or something like that. How much? How many water molecules would you cr- right. create? And you had to go through all the processes of fat, proteins, and wow. glucose, and then add up the water. That's cool. But some animals, I'm thinking camels for some reason. I knew you were going to say camels. Um, I knew it. Get enough water molecules from cellular respiration to keep it going, right? Alive, um, if they're not drinking. So and and the got camel a very efficient cellular respiration. Process? I think that they're getting it from fat because the humps are just fat, and so right. they're just breaking down fat. So beta oxidation into acetylcholine and then driving that presumably the same thing. But the, they can somehow access that cellular water for their survival. Look, it it makes sense. Like we need water f- for survival, and it's just hydrogen and oxygen. All of our primary nutrient sources: proteins, fats, carbs are all made up of carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. And the obviously the proteins have nitrogen added to it. But they all have oxygens and hydrogens that you can steal from, right? Yeah. You can steal the hydrogen and oxygen to make this water. And this is one process in which you can do that. So now we've got this high concentration of hydrogen ions, H+, in the intermembrane space. It needs to go down its concentration gradient by moving through this very complex protein, or I should say complex of proteins, called ATP synthase. Now, let's just explain it in a way that makes sense, I think. The hydrogen ions... It's like a water wheel. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like like a a, um, windmill, in a sense, where instead of the wind pushing the turbine... You've got hydrogens moving down. The gradient. It's gradient. Telling this protein to spin and the spinning of this protein physically forces ADP and phosphate together to form ATP. Right. And that's the ATP synthase. The whole, this, all of these steps. What we've done. From glycolysis. is just for this. Through the Krebs is simply for this one uh, protein complex to pump hydrogens down its concentration gradient, to spin some proteins, to physically force ADP and phosphate together to form ATP. And you form around about 32 to 36 ATP molecules at the end of all this process, yeah, yeah. which is amazing. And it that's is. it. A couple of side points here. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... With the electron transport chain, we've mm-hmm. got these complexes that we've spoke about that some is just purely about transporting the electrons amongst the, each other, yeah. which drives an electric current. But also there's some that is just pushing... Well, I guess in conjunction to that, we're also just vacuum cleaning the hydrogen into that inter-membrane uh, space. But there has to be that kind of process occurring for it to drive the whole process. Now, there are some things that kind of, some uh, drugs or some endogenous agents that sure. that break this kind of connection between the two. Particularly the electron transport chain. One of them is uh, an un- uncoupling agent. Um, so it kind of puts a protein on the membrane and it loses... Of the cell or the mitochondria? Of the mitochondria. Yep. And you lose all the hydrogen. It just pulls the hydrogen back in. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that in the, 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 the protein or the hormone that does this is called thermogen or thermogenin. Right. And so this can be seen in 
um, brown fat. Okay. And so we know. Wait, we make this? Yes. This is an endogenous Why? agent. Okay. So um, if you were to put this uncoupling agent into the membrane and you lose all the hydrogen gradient, what would it do? Is it you're still driving the electrons, but you're losing the gradient. Right. And so what that does is create heat. Oh. And so it's kind of like, I don't know, your car's engine's running. Right, because but it's not it excites driving. the proteins, yeah. but it can't release that energy through the, prote- the proton force. It has to release it in the form of heat. Correct. And right. so babies produce this in their brown fat. Oh, is this the thermogenic process of brown yes, fat? Yes, Is it really? Yeah. Is yeah. this how it works? Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. And also hibernating animals. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that that's how it worked. That is super cool. Yeah. Wow. There's also... Exo- but that also means they don't produce as much energy. Well, I guess they don't. At least in that tissue, hmm. they don't need to. Right. But the, the benefit of that is to regulate heat yeah. for the animal whilst they're either sleeping or for the baby. Oh, how cool. I don't know. Also sleeping. All right, next point. Aspirin can also play around with this. Where at? Uh, the same kind of uncoupling agent, oh. and this can lead to a mitoc- sorry, a metabolic acidosis because it releases the hydrogen ions into yeah. the cytoplasm. Right, and so that then is part of the reason for. I always thought metabolic acidosis from um, aspirin was due to because it is an acid, right? But it's actually partly because of this process. Okay, and then because of the effect that this could then have if you're influencing let's say, respiratory muscles mm. and you're not getting the energy for respiratory muscles, then you can get a respiratory acidosis from it as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's agents that uncouple. Or, what yeah. about like rat poison? Doesn't that come in at the mitochondrial? Oh, rat poison is just um, warfarin really. So I think you just bleed out. But isn't there another process in which it can inhibit some of these complexes? Yeah, so then... You can get the ones that will inhibit, I think, the synth- uh, synthase. Right. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Sorry. Um, there are a couple of agents that inhibit the complexes. So yep. cyanide inhibits that's complex it. four. Cyanide. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. So that will then stop the gradient or the electron movement. You just which don't produce any ATP. Right. And so that will lead to the death of the individual because every cell will be impacted at cell respiration. And you die pretty quick. Right, like this is the thing that people don't realize is that you'd go, well, ATP is really important for life, for just the general function of everything. So, wouldn't we evolve in abundance? We don't. We we've got like a few minutes of ATP available in our body that we will use up in, you know, obviously very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so it needs to be regenerated all the time. Hence why we need to eat all the time. Hence why we need fuel all the time. Yeah. We need this glucose. But yeah, that's amazing. Bar- barbiturates? Excuse will, me? Will Barbie what? <laughs> barbiturates. So that would be like pentobarbital yep. as an example. That would impact complex one, same outcome. This would be in a high dose. And these are like GAB, GABA agonist, I guess you'd say. Okay. But this would be in the toxic range of that, yeah. that drug. And the other one, which is interesting because you asked me this other day, statins. Right, yes. Remember you said something about... Statins and muscle pain. Muscle pain, yeah. Yeah. So statins, for some people, not everyone, will inhibit coenzyme, the coenzyme Q. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so what that does will decrease the ATP, particularly in muscle. Okay. So it just doesn't inhibit it completely, but maybe slows down that process. So is that the proposed mechanism as to why people get muscle pain with statins? So for some individuals, I guess it's impacting the electron transportation enough to to decrease the ATP in muscle, which Mm -hmm. then leads to cramping and then pain. Wow. But it could be enough for some individuals that leads to muscle death, which is rhabdo. Right. Which then can lead to kidney problems because you've got because I know that tendinopathies are very common f- in people with who take statins, yeah. and that I, I don't think they know why. I mean, I haven't investigated it. Yeah. But well, that's pa- interesting. Apparently, that is the the, the link there. Oh, there you go. Mm. Any other processes? Are we done with uh, cellular respiration? Yeah, I think that's that's it. Wow. Are we going to do some listener mail? Oh yes. I'll I sent you a couple. Okay. And. I will read a few as well. Okay. Which email did you send it to? Dr. Mike. All right. Let me... 
So, let's do some listener mail. Okay. Um, have you got your one? Nope. Oh, yes. Okay. You start, then I'll go. Hey, guys. I'm really liking your videos. This is from Alex. Um, do you have any OSCE tips for paramedic students? Matt, do you have any OSCE tips? We don't really teach paramedic students in the clinical space. We don't. We Our friend Sandy does. Yeah, Sandy's great, but that's not going to help you much at all. Um, Practice. Yeah, sorry, I can't really help in that space. Practice. Go, yeah. go to as many OSCE labs as you possibly can do. So definitely those, and definitely do you want have to tell people what OSCEs are? There might be people out there have no idea what an OSCE is. O-S-C-E. Basically, my understanding, I don't know what it stands for, but it's just a, a clinical... I don't know what it stands for either. To examination be assessment. Yeah. So practical assessment on doing clinical, clinical work. Clinical stuff. Yeah. yeah. I reckon practice. I know it's not super useful, but I think the more you physically do it, the more the muscle memory gets in. And when you, pr- you know, literally practice makes perfect. And if you're in immersed in the clinical environment, uh, you get to practice doing that particular task you'll do a better job when it comes to evaluating that OSCE. So practice, practice, practice. Uh, now, I haven't pre-read any of these emails, so we haven't been able to prepare any specific answers. So I don't even know what it's saying. So we've got one here from Maywind Osman. Maywind, uh, thank you for the email, first of all. Uh, the subject is, just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. But there is a message here. Can I please reach out and say thank you so much for your free content on YouTube? You're welcome. It has been unbelievably helpful. I'm turning 30 this year and spent six years of my life in prison. Whoa. And two years on strict parole condition with one year left to complete. Oh, amazing. However, I've enrolled in uni and your videos have been so uh, useful. They're my primary resource. Uh, way better than any uni lecturer. I've been able to learn and what they try and explain in five weeks in one video. Thank you kindly. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. I mean... Amazing. This is the first time I have heard anybody that has watched our videos. Obviously praise us. <laughs> that, to <laughs> praise us, yes. But um, I'm so glad we can help. So thank you. Thank you, Maywind. I've got an email from Susie Hook. Um, subject, I am so thankful. Exclamation mark. Message. I have just become a casual academic teaching nursing students in one, two and third year. So having to very quickly reacquaint myself with pathophysiology and of many body systems as well in general anatomy. But you guys make sense. I truly listen once or twice, review my study notes and voila, it makes sense and I can teach on. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Do I have another one? That's a question. I've got one more. Oh, Louise again. From Canada. Yeah. Remember she said that I stuffed up that uh, Santa Claus one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yep. So she's said, um, my students have requested a YouTube slash podcast on the peritoneum versus the mesenteries versus the amenta. You can do so, that. So we could do a podcast on it? Um, or do you think it's too niche? I don't know. I think uh, you can definitely do a video on it. Yeah. I know that. I actually have to do a, a video on that for embryology. Mm-hmm. I've got another... Well, there you go. You can do it. I've got a, another email uh, from Amri. Amri says, Hey, guys. I just started studying clinical nutrition at the age of 36. Uh, that's my age too, Amri. And honestly, you're probably the reason that I made it through the first semester. Well, thank you very much. I've come to realize that I want to master the basics of biochemistry and dive into the science to go beyond standard nutritional guidelines. If you guys had a course on cell biology and metabolism... I would be stoked. Thanks for making th- hard things fun. You're welcome, Amory. Really appreciate the email. We are trying to build some little online courses, breaking news, folks, uh, for people to be able to access. Uh, because it takes time and energy and it costs us money to make, we need to charge a very small amount. I don't know what that amount's going to be, but we'll have some mini online courses for people to be able to engage with and I will endeavour to make sure that they include biochemistry. Things like this podcast. Talking of making things, we've got a, a, an email from Jonathan and he made some fan art of you, Michael. Did he now? 
Do you want to see it? I do want to see it. Yeah, okay. can you show it to me? There. All right. Oh wow. Okay. Thank you. I think you partly look like Batman. Well, that's nice to say. I appreciate <laughs> it. Is that from Jonathan? That's from Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Very much appreciated. And, uh, the, and the last one okay. is one Alan. Alan's asked a quite a complicated question, which will take us a bit of time you to research. It. But basically, he's just asking a question on the neurophysiology of massaging a muscle on stretch. Oh, okay. So it's quite a long question. We'll I won't read it all out, but we'll have to do some investigation to see the benefit possibly of during a massage, stretching the muscle, how that could have a, a greater impact than a non-stretched muscle. Well, off the top of my head, I know that a recent study came out to show that a constant exaggerated stretch of the gastrocnemius, the calf, led to hypertrophy of the, tra- of the calf. So you can actually get muscle growth through stretching. Really? There's evidence for that. So how, does, how would that work physiologically? Well, I think when you think about muscle hypertrophy, particularly skeletal muscle, uh, you can get it through metabolic stress. You can get it through damage. And you can get it through load and resistance. And so you so probably... So wouldn't damage be the most... Com- oh, when you say damage, do you mean micro tearing? Yeah. But the thing is that the historically, we didn't think that damage alone... All metabolic stress alone were enough for hypertrophy. You needed them in conjunction with exposure to load. But this has demonstrated that you can get hypertrophy simply off the back of stretching. So I don't know if that's the case through massage. The thing was they did some... If you look at the paper, I don't know the title of the paper. It was extreme stretching of the gastroc. Like longer than you would normally do and more extreme than you normally would do. So whether that has any practical implications, I don't know. But we'll get back to you, Alan. Matt, we done? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this episode. If you like us... If you made it to the end. If you did make it to this point, please... And you didn't run out of of ATP. Give us a five-star rating. If it's not worth five stars, well, I'm sorry. Uh, you can follow us on social media at Dr. Mike Todorovic. You can send us an email if you go to Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike. No, Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike. Com. Au, and emails from our website. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you want to join our mailing list, which has updates of podcasts, YouTube videos, and just additional fun content and some uh, other educational resources we produce, go to Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike. Com. Au, and sign up to our newsletter. Uh, We'll be sending newsletters out hopefully monthly very soon. But apart from that, thank you, Matthew. And we'll be back with more biochemistry soon. soon. Please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.